Okay guys, welcome back to chapter seven. So last time we talked about the cranial bones and structures. Today we're gonna move on to the second part of our axial skeleton. We're gonna be talking about your um, bones that are associated with the vertebral column. Okay, so this one's gonna talk about vertebral, vertebral bones and all of the associated structures. Um, and then I did cut development out at the end of the chapter, but I'm just going to finish up with our axial skeleton and then I'll go into like, um, your, uh, appendicular skeleton in the next one. Okay. So we're talking about the vertebral column. So this is talking about your spine. So our general characteristics here are that it's going to extend from the skull to the pelvis. We've previously talked about the skull. So it's also called the spine or the spinal column. So all these words are used interchangeably. And the function is to transmit the weight from the trunk to the lower limbs and then to surround and protect our spinal cord and provide attachment points for ribs and muscles. Okay, um, there's also a flexible curvature structure that contains 26 irregular bones that are called vertebrae in five major regions that we're gonna be talking about. Okay, so our regions and curvatures. We have um, the different regions that are about 28 vertebrae long. Um, it's a, it's a, about 28 vertebrae long vertebral column that's actually broken into these five different regions. So you can see them listed here. So we have our cervical spine, we have our thoracic, lumbar, sacrum, and coccyx. Okay, so the cervical um, vertebrae is referring to seven vertebrae. Those are up at the top. So this is from top to bottom. This is how they are arranged. And then our thoracic spine is talking about 12 different vertebrae. Then underneath that, we have the lumbar spine, which is five vertebrae. And um, we'll talk about this mealtime thing later. Then we're gonna get into the sacrum, which is actually a fusion of a couple different uh, vertebrae together. And then our coccyx, which is like equal to the tailbone, it's the same thing. Um, that's also a fused bone and it's several different vertebrae fused together. And actually your coccyx is the reason that some people have um, a longer or shorter spine, like more vertebrae included in there because your coccyx can be like, it's usually two, two to five vertebrae that are fused together, but sometimes it's longer and sometimes it's shorter. So that's why the number of vertebrae would differ in different people. Okay. So our curvatures, a curvature is, you know, a curve because our backs are not perfectly straight. Like you might say, sit up straight, but if your spine is perfectly straight, it actually wouldn't be very good at bearing weight. Okay, so we have these curvatures and there's four main, Reagan, there's four main curvatures in the column that help to increase the resiliency and flexibility of our spine. So we have the cervical and lumbar curvatures that are going to be concave. And then we have the thoracic and sacral curvatures that are going to be convex. And we'll take a look at that in just a second. So here, this is going to be like the anterior view. This is from the front. You see that our spine looks very straight up and down, right? But from the side, when you're looking at our right lateral view here, you can see that there's a lot of curving happening here. So in our cervical curvature, which is gonna be up at the top, notice the four regions. We have one, two, three, and four, and down here, five, our coccyx. Okay, but then we have our curvatures that are listed here. So concave is gonna be the first one at the top. Okay, the next one is a little bit more obvious. It's got a convex that it's definitely going in so it's kind of like C shapes that are going in like opposite directions, right? Then we have another concave, which is going to look a lot like the one up top that it's going to be a C shape going like this way. Sacral, we have convex. Okay. So that's going to be going back this way. So we have those four different um, curvatures in our spine. And again, that's in order to help maintain the um, distribution of weight on the body, because if it was just straight up and down, it wouldn't be very good at bearing weight. Okay, ligaments are also gonna be important when we're talking about the spine and the vertebral column because that's how um, we get support, right? So ligaments, along, they're gonna be along the trunk muscles. They're going to help support the vertebral column. So you have um, anterior and posterior longi like longitudinally, so up and down long ways, both the front and the back of the body. You're gonna have all these ligaments that are attached to the spine to help you maintain structure and help to su provide support. So we have ligaments that are um, these continuous bands from the neck to the sacrum, so all the way up and down your whole spine that are gonna run um, down the front and back of the spine for support. So they have support and prevent hypertension, um, hyperextension in the back, like backwards. So you're not going to bend too far backwards and actually like end up breaking your spine and ruining all those nerves that are in there too. 
or hyperflexion, which is going to be a forward bend, right? You're going to have a lot of support here because all these ligaments are wrapping around your entire spine to keep you from bending too far forward or too far backwards in order to keep your spine in the best shape as possible. Then you also have your ligamentum flavum, which is going to be just um, ligaments that are connecting uh, vertebrae that are right next to each other. And then you have short ligaments that are going to connect each vertebra to the ones um, above and below. So we're going to look at some images of those in a minute. Okay, so um, we'll talk about vertebral discs in a little bit, but you can see all the different vertebrae here. Like the top section is like complete and then the bottom section is like half, right? It's like cut in half. So this is the median section of these three different vertebrae that you're looking at here. So there's a whole bunch of different words that we did not talk about, but we talked about our ligamentum flavum just now. Okay, so you can understand that that is existing between all of these uh, little vertebrae. Okay, here's another view. This is gonna be the anterior view of part of our spinal column. So here you can see a whole bunch of ligaments. Okay, so you have your longitudinal ligaments that are gonna be running front and back on our spine in order to add support. Okay, and then it's listing some other things that we'll talk about here in a little bit. Okay, these intervertebral discs I'm talking about. You've probably heard of someone like, oh, I have a slipped disc in my back. Like, what does that actually mean, right? It causes a lot of pain, but so basically these little discs, they're discs of like, you know, like a ligament, all right? So they are cushion-like pads that are sandwiched between the vertebrae. So you have like bone, squishy tissue, bone. Okay, and that's all the way up and down your whole spine. Okay, so they act as little tiny like shock absorbers, essentially. Okay, so they're composed of two different parts. You have part one and you have part two. So the nucleus um, pulposus, which is going to be like this inner, the inner part. It's like this inner nucleus region. It's kind of like gelatinous. It's, it's squishy. It's a shock absorber. You wouldn't have something very hard being a shock absorber. It's got to be flexible. Okay, and then it gives the disc its elasticity and compressibility. So if you think about all the different ways that your body moves throughout the day and sitting and standing and reaching and jumping and that impact hitting the ground, right? You need to have some sort of cushion between these bones. Otherwise, they're just gonna be ground, grinding on each other and eventually like wearing away, which is really bad, right? And then your second part of our intervertebral disc is gonna be the analyst fibr um, fibrosis which is going to be the outside. So if it's kind of like a, like a little disc, okay, we're talking about like the outer region and then there's kind of like this like inner region. Okay, so this outer region is gonna be our part two here and the inner region would be like the first part. Okay, so our um, analyst fibrosis is gonna be the outer collar that's gonna be composed of collagen, which we know is a very strong fiber and then our fibrocartilage. And it's going to limit the expansion of the nucleus pulposus when compressed. So when you have weight that's pushing down on your spine, this little disc is gonna give a little bit, right? It's going to squish a little bit. It's going to compress a little bit, but not too much, okay? So the analyst fibrosis is going to limit that expansion. So when you're pushing down on your intervertebral discs, the uh, nucleus pulposus is not going to go outward. It's just going to compress as much as it should. And then the analyst fibrosis is like a stronger component because our collagen fibers are strong, whereas our nucleus pulposus is made of like a gelatin. It's much squishier. That's got to stay in the middle between the vertebrae, whereas our analyst fibrosis is going to be, um, you know, still between them, but slightly on the outside region. So this is kind of what I was talking about here. So you can see it's kind of this like ring structure. It's not a perfect circle. Okay, um, this is the superior view of a herniated intervertebral disc. So you can see that the herniated portion of the disc here, right, it's coming out of where it should be. Okay, and it's actually like pushing on these, um, these nerves, which is why it causes pain. Right, so it should be kind of like this, um, almost like a weird bean shape, like a little Tiffany necklace bean is what it kind of looks like to me. Right, it's not a perfect circle because you have this little like indentation where you have our actual uh, spinal cord running, right? But this herniated disc is when we have a slipping of the nucleus pulposus that's actually extending beyond the area where it should. And then it causes, you know, it's pushing out on the analyst fibrosis, which is gonna be then um, pushing on that nerve, which causes pain. Here's another image of what this actually would look like. So this is an MRI of the lumbar region. So it's, you know, your lower back, which is where this is very common. Um, of the vertebral column, and this is a sagittal section, so we're going vertically, 
um, showing your herniated disc. So you can see here that that disc has kind of like migrated, right? It's moved to an area where it shouldn't be. So remember that the nucleus pulposus is supposed to stay exactly between the vertebrae and then it's gonna be our annulus fibrosus that's around that in order to help keep it there. But here it is called like a slipped disc or herniated disc that it has moved slightly. It's not like it came out completely, but it's just compressed and moved slightly out of position. Okay, we also have some different um, abnormal spinal curvatures that can exist, um, whether they are genetic diseases or just different things that develop throughout your lifetime, like our kyphosis here and lordosis. Um, this is more common in like the elderly. And then this is, you know, obviously she's a pregnant woman. Your spine is going to have a different curvature for that time of your life in order to um, help you stay upright and help you stay balanced. Because if your spine didn't move at all and suddenly you have all this extra weight on the front of your body, you're gonna fall over, right? So it's to help you stay in balance. Okay, so our general structures of the vertebrae. So all vertebrae have a common structural pattern that are gonna consist of these following things we're gonna talk about. So there's the body, which is also called the centrum. It's the anterior, so the front side, weight-bearing region. So this is the part where you're gonna have all those discs in between, right? You have your um, vertebral arch that's gonna be composed of two pedicles. You have uh, short pillars that are gonna form the sides of the arch. And then you have two uh, laminae um, that are going to be fused flat plates um, that are gonna form our posterior arch. And all of this is gonna be in a picture in a second. Okay, you also have vertebral foramen, which remember is just like, um, like a hole, okay? It's um, an enclosure formed by the body and the vertebral arch coming together, so where they're actually connecting. And then you have the vertebral canal, again, another word for like, you know, a, a hole of some sort. So this is gonna be the series of vertebral foramina, another word for hole. And so these intervertebral foramina are going to be these little lateral openings between the vertebrae for the passage of our spinal nerves. Now, remember that the vertebrae, the spinal column, you know, it's all there to support our body, but then also to protect our spinal nerves. Okay, so here's an image of the typical vertebral structure. So this is the posterior, which is gonna be the back and the anterior, which is the front, right? This is your front. So that body is going to be in the front and that is the weight bearing region. Right, so this section here is gonna be the weight bearing region and that's where you're going to have all of those intervertebral discs to help you cushion all of the, um, the shock, the shock absorbers, right? So like I said, you have your vertebral arch that we just talked about here. You have your lamina, your pedicle. So those are the structures that we just talked about. Okay, um, so our vertebrae have seven different processes. So remember processes are just like there's something, um, some little like articulation, some little, um, demarcations or uh, bumps and things like that that are on them. So you have the uh, spinous process, which is going to be projecting posteriorly, so to the back. You have transverse processes that are going to project laterally. You have our superior and the inferior articular processes that are gonna protrude superiorly or inferiorly, respectively. Okay, so there's two of each of these, which gives you, that's really ugly, oh well. It's going to give you six, that's not a six, that's a six and then our one up here. So for a total of our seven processes altogether that each vertebrae contains. So next we're gonna talk about the different regions of our vertebral characteristics here. So we're gonna talk about the cervical spine first. So our, our cervical vertebrae, we're talking about C1 to C7. So it's like cervical vertebrae one, cervical vertebrae two, all the way to seven. Okay, so these are gonna make up our smallest and our lightest vertebrae and they're closest to your head. They're at the top of your spine. Okay, so when we're talking about C3 to C7, they're gonna share the following characteristics. So the top two are special. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the different regions of our spine. So the first region we're gonna talk about is the cervical vertebrae, which is gonna be the uppermost region of your spine. So we're dealing with C1 to C7, which just means cervical vertebrae one, cervical vertebrae two, and so on all the way to number seven. Okay, so they're the smallest and the lightest of all the vertebrae that make up your spine. And the top two, C1 and C2, are special. We'll talk about those in a minute. But when we're dealing with um, C3 to C7, they're gonna share these characteristics, okay? They're all oval-shaped. The body is all oval-shaped. The exception is C7. 
because it's got a different um, process. It's just a different projection that's going to be um, splitting off a little bit different. Okay, they are all large and um, trying. They have large triangular vertebral foramen, which remember is like an opening. Um, the transverse foramen found in each of these transverse processes for the artery passageways are going to be there. You have C7 is also going to be um, vertebrae prominence, which can, is um, very large and can be felt through the skin. So this is like a landmark. We'll, t we'll look at a picture. It's like this large posterior projection off the back. I'm really great at drawing. Off the back of your uh, vertebrae, and that can actually be felt through the skin. Okay, these little charts um, appear several times throughout this lecture. I'm just going to let you pause and read them. It's all the regional characteristics. So right now we're focusing on the cervical spine. So if you want to stop and look at those characteristics, there's also some images provided here and then our lateral views as well. Okay. So right now, like I said, we're talking about the cervical vertebrae. So that's dealing with this blue section up at the top. And I'm actually going to erase that. So then you can see this little guy right here that we're talking about. Okay, so that is our, that's our longer projection. Okay, that's why our C7, that's the end of the um, cervical vertebrae. It has the vertebrae prominence, which is going to be this special little projection that you can actually feel through your skin. Okay, so when I told you that C1 and C2 are special because they have different jobs, we will focus on those in a minute. But that little section was about C3 and C7 and the characteristics that they share in common. Okay, so the cervical vertebrae continued. We're going to talk about C1, the atlas, and C2, the axis, and their unique features. So those are the top two up at the very, very top, okay? So we're dealing with the top two, C1 and C2, so these guys right here, okay? They're at the very top, so your skull would be sitting up here, okay? That would be your skull. All right, so they have very unique features because they're meeting up with your skull. It's an attachment site, essentially, okay? So we have the atlas, which is going to be C1. It's the top, our top vertebrae, the cervical vertebrae. It has no body or spinous process. Um, it consists of an anterior and posterior arch and two lateral masses, and we'll look at a picture of that in just a second. So its shape is a little bit different than a normal vertebrae. Um, the superior surfaces of the lateral masses are actually going to articulate with the occipital condyles. So that's literally where your skull interacts with your um, vertebrae. That's where it's going to sit. Okay, it's literally where it sits. So the occipital condyles carry the skull. That's like the attachment site. It's like a little pivot point. Okay, and the movement for nodding the head, yes, is responsible because you have this atlas there. It's You're able to move your head forwards and backwards saying yes, nodding your head yes. Okay, because of the C1 and the way that your head attaches to your body, to your um, to your spine there. it's You're able to say yes, because that movement is given to you by the atlas joining up with your skull. Okay, so this is a superior view of your atlas, which is the C1. It's at the very, very top of our cervical spine or cervical vertebra. So you can see those lateral masses that we talked about and you have a posterior and anterior arch. Okay, remember that these are going to be the, um, the articular facets. That's where you're actually gonna have the connection with the condyles. Okay, um, this is a inferior view of the same bone. So the first and second cervical vertebrae here. Okay, the axis is gonna be C2, which is gonna be just one down from our atlas in our cervical spine. So it has a body and processes like all of the other vertebrae, but it's still slightly different. Um, the major feature is a knob-like dens, okay, that's actually gonna project superiorly into the anterior um, arc of the atlas. Okay, so you'll see that in just a minute that it's actually going to um, interact with our atlas. And the dens is the missing body of the atlas. Because remember that the body is the weight bearing section. So we have this like little bump essentially that's going to extend from the axis up towards the atlas in order to give it its, um, its weight bearing capability. So the dens is also a um, pivot for rotation of the atlas. So this is a, the axis is what allows you to say no, to turn your head rotation side to side, no. Okay, so remember the atlas that we talked about up here gives you the capability to nod your head yes, that's the atlas. And then the axis is going to give you that rotation to turn your head to say no. 
Okay, so here's an image of this. This is the superior view of our axis, which is C2. Remember that that is the second vertebrae and our cervical vertebrae. Okay, so you can see our, um, our dens right here is that little projection that's actually gonna go up to help give the quote missing body to our um, atlas, which is right above. And then of course we have our little, um, the spinous process that we talked about that's characteristic of all of our other vertebrae that this one does have as well. Okay, this is an actual view of what this would look like. So this is the photo of the C2 superior view. And then again, this is our whole cervical vertebrae. So this is this blue section here. The top two have the you know special characteristics. You have the atlas and the axis. We just talked about those. C3 through C7 share other characteristics that we've previously talked about as well. And then of course you can see how the dens is actually going to extend up from the axis into the atlas here. So that's what gives some weight bearing capability up to our atlas. Okay, so moving into the next region down, we have the thoracic vertebrae. So these are gonna be called thoracic vertebrae one, thoracic vertebrae two, all the way to 12. And they're going to increase in size and they're going to articulate with the ribs. And again, articulate just means like they're going to interact with, they're going to meet up with, they're going to join with. So in some way they're attached to our ribs, okay? So the unique characteristics of our thoracic vertebrae are gonna be as follows. Um, the body is actually heart-shaped instead of oval-shaped. So the body is heart-shaped with two small demi-facets that articulate with the ribs. So again, just interact, meet up with, to pair with the ribs, okay? So T10 and T12 have only a single facet. So this is gonna be the bottom two vertebrae, only have a single facet, not two. Okay, because your ribs at the bottom are just like slightly different structure than the ribs up at the top. You're only gonna have one attachment point. Okay, you have the vertebral foramen is going to be circular here. So the hole is gonna be circular. Um, you have long, sharp, spinous processes um, that are going to point inferiorly. Um, you have the transverse processes that are going to have transverse coastal facets that articulate with the ribs. Okay, except for the bottom ones like we talked about earlier. Okay, and then the location of the articular facets allows the rotation of this area of the spine. So you have like rotation, your body can twist side to side. That's what we're talking about. This is that same chart that I mentioned earlier. Now we're just, we've moved through the cervical and we're talking about the thoracic. If you wanna stop and look at those details, same thing here, dealing with thoracic, same thing here, dealing with thoracic this time. Okay, so this is the image. So you can see this is like a very large piece of our spine. So we've already talked about the cervical spine. This is the um, thoracic spine. So as I said, these are some of the um, unique characteristics of our thoracic vertebrae. Um, some of the things that we just talked about, the inferior coastal, coastal facets. We talked about the inferior articular processes, the spinous processes that stick off the back. You can see that they kind of change in size as you go and that they're going to increase in size as you go down as you descend the spine. Okay, um, next we have our lumbar vertebrae, which are, if you've ever heard of like lumbar support or something, it's like if a chair has like a big poof, like right where your lumbar spine is, it's towards the bottom of your spine, that's lumbar support and that becomes important as you get older and your body starts to, you know, start slowing down, breaking down a little bit. So your lumbar vertebrae, we're talking about L1 to L5, which again is lumbar, vertebral vertebrae one, lumbar vertebrae two, all the way to five, and it is the small of your back. So it is that like inner curving, that little convex or concave um, curvature at the bottom of your spine, the small of your back. Um, it receives a lot of stress, the most stress of the spine. Um, and then the bodies are massive because of that. So remember that the bodies are actually the, um, the weight bearing part of the vertebrae. So there's other characteristics that are specific to our lumbar vertebrae. They, are, they have short, thick pedicles and laminae. They are flat, hatchet-shaped um, spinous process points that are going to point posteriorly, like normal. Our vertebral foramen are going to be triangular in this case, which is a different shape for us here. Um, the orientation of the articular facets are going to lock our lumbar vertebrae together to prevent rotation because your uh, lumbar vertebrae doesn't move side to side and spin and rotate like your other sections of your spine do. Again, same chart, we've talked about these, now we're focusing on lumbar here. Same thing here, dealing with lumbar superior view. We have lumbar right lateral view. 
Okay, so here we can see the lumbar vertebrae. Previously, we had the thoracic vertebrae and then the cervical vertebrae above that. Okay, so this is now our one, two, third section here um, that we we're talking about the lumbar vertebrae. And of course, we talked about how the body is going to be massive, much larger here because this is the most um, stress containing area of your spine. So next we'll talk about the median sacral crest that have roughened bumps on the posterior midline, so the back, middle, um, and then the lateral sacral crest, which is a roughened area um, that's seen on the lateral sides, on the posterior side. You have posterior sacral foramina, which remember are just little openings. They're, well, they're large in this case, large openings for the sacral spinal nerves, again, for nerve and blood supply. You have the um, sacral canal, again, is like an opening, so it's a continuation of the vertebral canal, again, an opening. Uh, and then the sacral hiatus, which is a large opening at the end of this canal. So you have a whole bunch of different openings here that allow for nerve and blood supply to flow through. Um, lastly, at the bottom of the spine, you have your coccyx. Okay, so the coccyx is your tailbone. And again, we have like a, it's either somewhere between three to five fused vertebrae. That's why the total number of vertebrae can differ from individual to individual. Um, and it's going to articulate superiorly with the sacrum and it has very little function because it's just kind of like these little tiny bones that are all fused that hang off the end of your sacrum. It's called the coccyx, they're your tailbone. They are vestigial structures in us as humans. Um, you know, at one point in our evolutionary history, they may have served a purpose to be a, um, like a tail appendage. Whereas now they don't really serve a purpose, but you know that if you break it, it's awful. You have to sit on that donut and it hurts and there's nothing you can do about it. So this is kind of what we're talking about here. So we have our sacrum and our coccyx down here. So those are the two different structures we just talked about. Um, we talked about all of the different um, sacral foramina, right? All these little holes that appear. Um, we talked about the transverse ridges, these little spiny ridges that are like little demarcations of the fusion. Okay, um, and we also talked about our coccyx down here at the bottom. And this is your tailbone and again, it's like a vestigial structure. It doesn't really have a purpose. This is gonna be the posterior view here, right? So this is anterior down at the bottom. And then this one is your posterior view. You can see even more of that ridge that um, the median sacral crests that you can see, right? Okay, so lastly, to finish off our axial skeleton, which is our trunk, um, we're gonna talk about the thoracic cage. So this is of course referring to your ribs, right? So it's gonna be composed of your thoracic vertebrae posteriorly, um, you have the sternum and then the coastal cartilage anteriorly and then our ribs laterally. So that makes up the whole of the um, thoracic cage. So these three parts here. Our functions of course are gonna to be to protect our vital organs like our lungs and our heart of the thoracic cavity. Um, it's going to help to support your shoulder girdles and um, our upper limbs where they're attaching to the body. Uh, it's going to provide attachment sites for um, our muscles of the neck, the back, the chest, and our shoulders. So here's an image of our thoracic cage or like this is our ribs we're dealing with here. So um, this is the skeleton of our thoracic cage. You can see that you have a lot of cartilage present here as well as bone and running um, words are difficult today. Posteriorly, you have your spine that you can see that we've already talked about. Okay, so your sternum is going to be on the anterior side of the front. Um, it's also called your breastbone because it exists between breasts on either a man or a woman. You all have breast tissue, sorry. Okay, um, so they're called the, it's called your breastbone and it consists of three different fused bones. So these are the ones here. Um, so you have your manubrium, that's going to be the um, superior portion that's actually going to articulate your with your clavicular notches. So that's your clavicle, your collarbone, and ribs one and two. You have the body, which is going to be the mid portion of your breastbone that articulates with the coastal cartilages of, ribbed, <laughs> of our ribs two through seven. And then you have the xiphoid process, which is going to be the bottom, the inferior end that is the site of our muscle attachment. Um, and it's not even ossified until about age 40. So it's not completely like hard, firm bone until much later in your life. So next, continuing to talk about the sternum, we have three different important anatomical landmarks we're gonna talk about. The jugular notch, which is going to be a central indentation in the superior border of the manubrium, which is the upper region. 
you have the sternal angle, which is a horizontal ridge across the front of the sternum, and then the xiphosternal joint, which is going to be um, where the sternal body and the xiphoid process actually fuse together. So that's gonna be like the lower portion. So you can see those labeled here. So we're dealing with a mid-sagittal section here um, of the, the um, of the thorax. Wow, words are difficult. Okay, so we're showing here our sternum. You can see our sternal angle. You can see the jugular notch, and you can see our xiphosternal joint. So those are the ones that we're talking about there. So next we're talking about ribs. The ribs are obviously important to your thoracic cage because they make up the lateral components of it. We talked about the front, the sternum. We talked about the back, your spine. Now we're going to talk about the 12 pairs that form the sides, 12 pairs of ribs that form the sides of your thoracic cage. So all of these are going to attach posteriorly to the bodies and transverse processes of the thoracic vertebrae that we just recently talked about. So we have true ribs and we have false ribs. Our true ribs are actually directly attached to the sternum by individual coastal cartilages. And then we have our false ribs that are gonna be the latter pairs. We have one through seven at the top and then eight through 10 at the bottom here, just the last couple that actually attach indirectly to the sternum by joining the coastal cartilage of the rib above. So it's actually just attaching itself to the cartilage above it. So we also have vertebral floating ribs here. Um, so there's no attachment to the sternum at all. And that is going to be our last couple of ribs, the, um, the lower part, the inferior part. So we can look at that here. So you can see our little floating ribs out here. They're kind of interesting little structures that they're much more inferior to the rest of it. And then you can see our little, um, our cartilage junctions existing here between the ribs that we just talked about as well. Okay, so the main parts of a rib, you have the shaft, the head, the neck, and the tubercle. So the shaft is gonna be the flat bone that makes up most of the rib. Um, you have these little coastal grooves in there that are gonna house our nerves and our vessels. Again, it's a groove, think about a hole. What do they do? They allow the flow of nerves and blood. Okay, you have the head, which is gonna be the posterior, the back, the back side. Okay, it's going to articulate with the facets or the demi facets on the bodies of two adjacent vertebrae. So remember that the body is the big, like more like oval shaped section. Um, then we're gonna have the neck, which is going to be the constricted portion beyond the head. And then lastly, we have the tubercle, which is the, uh, it's kind of like a little knob. It's a knob like structure that's lateral to the neck. Okay, and this is going to articulate posteriorly with the transverse coastal facet of the same numbered thoracic vertebrae. So you can kind of see all that happening here. You have the tubercle, you have the neck, you have the head, we have the shaft here. This is gonna be your sternum in the front where you have everything attaching, and then in your back you have your spine. So then your ribs kind of like wrap around, right? So that's what everything looks like put together here. Okay, and then this is the superior view of the articulation between the rib and the thoracic vertebrae. So you can see the shaft here, you see the body of our um, vertebrae, and then of course the, the um, neck and the head here of our rib. And this is an actual view of what a typical rib would look like. This is rib number six, and it's the right rib number six, and this is a posterior view. Okay, so that is the end of our axial skeleton discussion. So we made it through this one. Our next video is gonna be all about the appendicular skeleton. So all about our appendages, how your arms and legs are actually attached to the trunk of your body, which is made up of the axial skeleton. So thanks for sticking with me with that and have a great day.